But how can they call on him they've not believed in? How can they believe without hearing about him? How can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Let's pray. God, we thank you for being with us today, God. We thank you for your promise that you'll, you'll never leave us, that you'll never forsake us. God, we pray that in our, our time of singing, in our time of worship, God, that we're somehow able to, to stop thinking about all those things that, that we've got planned for the day and, and what we got coming up in this week, God, somehow that we're able to just stop for this moment and to put our attention on that one thing that is truly worthy of our attention, God, and that's you. God, be with us in our service today, God, we beg that. Uh, be with us in our singing. God, be with me in our message today, God, that, that we're able to, to see how you are moving in this area around us, God. And I pray that you, you, you put a spark in every one of us to jump on board with exactly what you're doing. In Christ's name, amen. First of all, let me introduce myself. If you don't know me, you're one like... Who's that guy? Well, that's a good question, and you have good reason to ask that, because it's so rare that I get to be with the adults anymore. I'm Gary McIntyre. I'm the pastor to students here. Um, you know, every once in a while, we figure Al's been in the office enough, and we just say, man, you just got to go. Take two weeks. Just just go. And uh, so he said, all right, uh, I need you to preach that, that Sunday morning. All right, so I'm Gary McIntyre. I'm the pastor of students. Normally at this time, I'm with the kids' worship, helping Janet out in there, leading the music, and we kind of swap teaching and stuff. And so that's where I'm usually going to be. Now this, you are right. If you're thinking, that looks like a beach ball. <laughs> it is. Years ago, before I was a youth pastor here, uh, I was helping out with the youth and stuff, and we just had a disciple now, and so, and, and we're in here, and we're all in our disciple now shirts and stuff. It's a Sunday morning. Warren Wolf walks up to me. He don't even know me. He just walks up to me, and he says, boy, you going to a beach party? Oh, and I tried to explain to him what was going on, and he just kind of had this glint in his eye, and he just kind of walked away. I'm like, what just happened? Uh, if I can find out later, that's Warren, and it was great. Today, we're not going to a beach ball party either. This is what we call in seminary an illustration. All right, that was for free, by the way. That was for free. So if you ever wonder, hey, what was that thing called? It was an illustration. All right, so Isaac Newton, he didn't make this law. It's not like he sat down one day and said, you know what I haven't done in a while? make laws. No, he, he was able to figure out that there are certain laws in nature and that how they, they all work together and stuff consistently. And one of the things that he came upon was this idea that an object in motion stays in motion unless a force acts upon it. And that an object at rest will stay at rest unless a force acts upon it. Hence the illustration. All right, so now I got this beach ball. Now I can do a lot of things with this beach ball. I can toss it up in the air. Somebody's going, he threw a ball in church. Yes, it's an illustration, so that's okay. So now here we have, I just tossed the ball up in the air. What happened? Did it keep going up? It did not keep going up. Why? Well, before Isaac Newton, no one knew why. Then he wrote a law that said, oh, well, that makes perfect sense because an object that is in motion tends to stay in motion unless a force acts upon it. Well, it just so happens there was a force that acted upon it, and that would be called... That's an illustration right there, and that works because y'all got exactly where I was going. Good job with that. Yeah, it was gravity. I threw it up in the air, and it fell back down to the ground because it was an overwhelming force that exceeded my ability to toss that thing up into space, right? Well, an object at rest tends to stay at rest until, you know, some force acts on it. Well, if you've been paying close attention, and I think you have, you will have noticed that ball has not moved since it hit the ground. Now, it could... You know, a wind blows. So somebody could even walk by that, and just that, that little gust of air could cause it to move. But right now, it's perfectly content being a beach ball in the middle of church. Now, I know some of y'all, unless I move it, 
That's going to be where your fixation is for the rest of the message. All right, so I'm going to get that thing off the floor so you're not like, is he just going to leave that there? So now we'll put that right there. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. All right? An object continues to do what it's going to be doing unless a force acts upon it. And if an object is, is at rest, it tends to stay at rest. If you are the parent of a teenager, you've seen this in action many times. Hey, I need you to clean your room. In a minute, they're at rest. I need you to clean your room. <sighs> Boy, I'm going to take that thing away from you. You're not going to see it from a year. Now, all of a sudden, they've been acted upon by a force that compels them to move, right? If an object is it, you know, in motion, it continues to move without it changing its speed or anything unless something acts upon it. Now, you see this in practicality in space, in our space program. Uh, or you can look at the moons. You can look at the, the moons. You can look at the moon. You can look at comets. You can look at the uh, earth going around the sun. All these things are in constant motion, and pretty much the only thing that's keeping them from flying off into space is that they have been attracted by the sun, or the moon's been attracted by the earth, and it's in orbit around it. It's moving. It's moving pretty fast. The moon you know, I was wondering the other day, just how fast is the moon moving? 2,300 miles per hour. That's pretty fast. 2,300 miles per hour. It's just like, zoo, zoo, and it does that too. It makes that sound. Zoo. And it, so it's out there, and it's doing this, its own moon thing. But while this is doing its own moon thing, you have the earth, and it's doing its earth thing around the sun. So I was wondering, I wonder how fast the earth is moving around the sun. You're wondering it too now. 67,000 miles per hour. That's not too shabby. That's not too shabby at all. I was watching something the other day on TV about this, this, this probe, the this spacecraft that we sent to Saturn nine, ten years ago. I don't know. It's, it's not even around anymore. It went right into Saturn. But that was part of the plan. It's out there. I wonder how fast that was going. 76,000 miles per hour. That's pretty fast, by the way, if you're wondering... In case you're sitting there, hey, does that sound fast to you? That's pretty fast. 76,000 miles per hour, this thing is zooming through space. Well, how do you get something up to 76,000 miles per hour? That's a lot of fuel, isn't it? Well, you don't need that much fuel. You just need enough fuel to get it up into space, to break the force of gravity, to get into space. Once it's out there and you escape the Earth's gravity, if you can get that thing going, it's going to keep going. Why? Well, Mr. Newton here, he told us that an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless a force acts upon it. So that thing just kept on going until it got up to a speed about 76,000 miles an hour. Then they can cut the power off, and it's just coasting. Which, by the way, that's pretty fast coasting. So there's going. But sometimes getting an object to move, that can be a particularly tough thing. Um, about 15 years ago, we got a dog. Dog's name was Sadie. Uh, sad thing, we had to put her down recently. But one of the things that stays with me to this day was the fact that sometimes getting that dog to move was a near impossible feat. It, it really was. And so we'd keep her outside during the day, and we'd keep her in a crate at night. And in the morning, I had a routine. I would get up, and I'd go down there, and I'd open the crate door so we can get her outside, and she'd just sit there. I'm like, I don't have time for this. Sometimes I could pull her out a little bit. Sometimes I could put her leash on her and kind of drag her out. I'm not joking. There have been times I've had to go behind the crate and pick it up so she'd slide out. And so, object in motion, right? So now, I put the leash on her. Now we begin the five-minute ordeal from her crate to the garage door. 15 feet away. Finally, I get her outside, and then I'll, she'll walk up to the little path that goes to our backyard gate, and she'll just stand there. And now, it's like, come on, come on. Every once in a while, I'd be able to get on the other side of her, because maybe she'd follow me, and sometimes I have to pull the thing. What I learned was if I got behind her, and I just went with my foot on her tail, boom, and that lasts for about three feet. 
pedestrian feet I didn't have before. And so now, and we'd do this, and finally she'd get in the backyard, and she goes like, oh, this is cool. Why didn't we come here sooner? I'm like, getting her to move was the trick. See, all I wanted from her was propulsion. I'd do the steering. I just wanted forward motion. I sometimes wonder if God feels the same way about us. God is a God of motion and movement, and his greatest works involve people motivated to move with him. And sometimes we don't want to go. Sometimes we don't know where to go. In in, in those moments, God sometimes gently prods us along. Sometimes God gently, like, tugs on the leash and says, come on, let's, let's get a move on. Sometimes we just don't go at all, and God just has to sometimes, you know, and we get moving. We don't know where we're going. All we know is that we find ourselves in motion. Why? Because God is a God of motion. See, God is not a God of inaction. God is not a God of passivity. God is a God of motion, and his actions are powerful, and they are effective. And when God moves, he expects his people to move with him. The whole Bible is a record of God moving. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis states that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I've never noticed that before. Because I was so quick to get past that part to the cool part where God speaks and light appeared. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. It's almost like if you could picture, maybe this, this is a poor illustration, just Bear with me. It's almost like Walt Disney looking over a swamp in Florida and envisioning a world-class theme park. He's not seeing what's there. He's seeing what could be there. And so you get this impression of the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the water. God's not seeing what's there, but what could be there. And then God takes action because God is a God of movement and motion. And God moved and things that weren't there before jumped into existence. Then his crowning achievement, a man and a woman, Adam and Eve. Bible says he saw all that very good. He gave him a set of instructions, very simple. All of this. All of this is yours. Do with it what you will. But this, that's mine. But all of this is yours. Stay away from this. But all of this, that's yours. But they started looking over there. And all of a sudden they had the voice of Satan whispering in their ear. Look how awesome that is. And they're going like, hey, you know what? That does look pretty awesome. And all of a sudden, they did exactly what God told them not to do, and sin entered into the world. But what happened next? When Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't look on passively. God moved. Adam and Eve had a son. Had several sons, actually, a lot of them. The ones we know about, Cain, Abel, and Seth. We know them by name. Cain and Abel, they had this thing going on. Cain killed Abel in a fit of jealous rage. When Cain killed Abel, God didn't look passively on. God moved. Later on, when God saw the wickedness that had inhabited the earth, and the Bible says he regretted ever creating all this, he sent a flood. Because he didn't look on passively, God moved. He started over again. Then after that, when God saw that all the people of the world, he gave the people of the world, by the way, a simple set of instructions. Spread out. Subdue it. Well, after the flood, all the people, they stayed together. And they stayed together. And they stayed together. And instead of spreading out, they started looking up. And they said, you know what? We want to ascend into the heavens. And we want to be like God. Well, all of a sudden, God's like, well, we can't have that now. So as they're building their tower... The Bible tells us God confused their languages. And all of a sudden, you had groups of people who couldn't understand the other groups. And what happened? 
they started spreading out. That's how we've got all the cultures and the languages that we have in this world today from that single moment in time where God said, you know what, I told them to spread out. They don't want to go. He just moves them along. He just flicks their tail, and there they are. They spread out. Why? God didn't look on passively. God moved. And then later on, when God saw he needed his people to be gathered into one place in order to grow into a nation, he didn't look on passively. God moved. When God heard the cry of his oppressed and enslaved people, God didn't look on impassively. God moved. And when God was ready to move his people to the land he chose for them, God didn't look on passively. God moved. The Bible, guys, I hope you understand this, the Bible is not a series of disjointed stories about people like Adam, about Eve, about Noah. The Bible isn't the story of Abraham. It's not the story of Joseph or Moses or Samuel or David. The Bible has only one main character, and it's God. Those other people, they're just characters that God uses to move his story forward. And though the Bible is a closed book today, we don't add to it, the story of God is still moving forward, and God still uses people to move that story forward. The thing is, when God moves, He expects His people to move with Him. See, God's moving often involves moving people to where He needs them. Much like a a chess, grand master positions pieces to work together to attack and advance. I like to play chess. Um, Years ago, I have a chess set on my desk in my office. Several years ago, I'm just sitting at my desk reading. Uh, Preschool was in session. And a former student, he's probably about seven years old at the time, he walks by my office and he sees my chess board. He says, oh, you play chess? I've had this conversation before. Everybody comes in there, and they move the pieces around. I don't even reset it anymore. He says, you want to play? I'm like, okay. And so I move, he moves, I move, he moves. I'm reading or something. I'll notice he moves. About six or seven moves in, I look up, I'll look down, and I'll look back up again, and I close my book. Because this kid is attacking my queen and my rook with a knight on purpose. Yep. He was good. He, he was good. Uh, I lost. I can't remember which piece I lost. It took, I came back and I won the game, but he had me at a disadvantage because I wasn't taking him seriously until that moment. And so then Angie comes in. She was preschool director at the time. Uh, I told her what happened. She says, well, of course he did. He was one of our preschool students. Well, So there you go. If you're ever wondering, by the way, where to send your kids to preschool, well, now you know. Apparently, we produce chess grandmasters here. So uh, sometimes we find ourselves being moved in a way that we didn't expect, sometimes in a way that we don't appreciate, only to find out later we're exactly where God wanted us to be. Sometimes we may never even know why we were moved. We can take comfort in the fact that people in the Bible, they were no different than us in this regard. They went through the exact same things, wondering, what is God doing? How did I end up here? Abraham had a simple set of instructions. Take your family and go. Abraham's like, okay. And that's what he did. And God blessed him because of that. All through the Old Testament, we see God moving his plan of salvation and restoration forward. But then something interesting happened. Things got quiet. During that time between the Old Testament and New Testament, there was several hundred years, maybe 400 years, where we have no record of God speaking or moving. That's not to say he wasn't there. That's not to say he wasn't setting things into motion. We just have no record of what he was doing. It's more like he was just letting things simmer down, settle. Things become perfect. Because when he did finally move, he moved in a big, big way. If Jesus had a best friend, it might have been his follower, his disciple, John. Okay? And John wrote about Jesus, and under the direction of God, he wrote these words. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
Maybe you don't know what that means. There's a chance that there's someone in here who's never heard these words before. That, that kind of sounds crazy. What does that mean, the word became flesh and dwelt among us? Well, when John was writing, he was writing to a group of intellectuals and a group of spiritual people. And he was trying to introduce this God concept to them in a way that they could understand. And so he's referring to Jesus as the Word, which would have been incredibly significant to those people who, was hearing it, who were hearing it. And so now he says this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Let me break it down into what he was really saying. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. And Jesus and God became flesh and dwelt among us. When God moved, he moved in a big, huge way. And that movement by God was so big and grand that all the forces of hell set out to put a stop to what God was doing. As soon as Herod found out what a king is going to be born, he set out to kill all the children under the age of two. This movement was so big that all of a sudden all the forces were coming together to stop it. And finally, when Satan saw that this wasn't going to work, when Jesus became an adult, Satan himself stepped in and tried to tempt Jesus into sinning because he knew that if he could get Jesus to do that, the whole plan was going to fall apart. Satan didn't know what the plan was. He just knew that God wanted this done. His best chance of success was to make sure that whatever this plan was, it was going to fail. In Jesus, we get to see God literally in motion. Literally in motion. See, prior to the time when Jesus came on the earth, those who knew God and knew of God, they've had little personal experience, little personal interaction with God. And they saw the results of him moving, but few actually ever got to see him move. All that changed with Jesus. God, the invisible mover, had become Jesus, the God with us. And Jesus was always on the move. Jesus set the example. He rarely stayed in one place, you know, waiting for people to come to him. He moved, and he called people to him for one purpose, to send them back out. You see how there were times where he sent his 12 disciples out, and he gave them simple instructions. Go. Don't take anything with you. Just go. If they don't like the message... When you leave the town, just wipe the dirt off your feet. Shrug the town off and go to the next one. Because there was a sense of urgency about it. We see a time when he sent out 72 followers to do the exact same thing. There was a sense of urgency because God was on the move. And there was an urgency to his moving. His parting words to his disciples, you know what they are probably. He said to them, as you are going... You probably know it as go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Literally what that means is as you are going, because the assumption is this, you're going anyway, while you're going, do this. As you are going, teach and baptize all nations. He tells them this, be my disciples in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the earth. For those of y'all who are geographically challenged, this is essentially what he's saying. I want you to be my disciples here. And I want you to be my disciples there. And I want you to be my disciples over there. And I want you to be my disciples way over there. Tell people about me. What happens when you apply the first law of motion to a church? A church in motion stays in motion unless a force acts upon it. See, the church was at its strongest when it was challenged and when it was persecuted and when it was on the move, often by force and by threat. The gospel really spread because people were compelled to move because there were certain penalties that came from being a Christian. Some of them were death, torture, imprisonment, and so they were greatly motivated to go. The thing is, these people were so dedicated to what they believed that when they went they took the message with them they were an object in motion but then something happened it was acted upon by a force that all of a sudden their growth became hindered and it's effective in its effectiveness and it's spread and it was this it became legal to be a christian and all of a sudden 
church is slowing down. They're becoming an object at rest. And when a church is at rest, it tends to stay at rest unless a force acts upon it. It, See, it became socially acceptable to be a Christian. So there was no risk. There was no motivation to get up and go and take the message with you. People were perfectly content to stay where they are. And all of a sudden, the church quit meeting in houses and stuff in secret. They started building these grand cathedrals and other things as our central meeting place. And all of a sudden, it became a way to gain power. And, it, and the people quit be, everything quit being about God and became more about just, you know, hey, look at our big buildings and look at what we are and pomp and ceremony and circumstance and all this kind of stuff. But God is a force that moves in mighty ways and his intention is for the church to move with him. And if a local church chooses to stay at rest and they can't be prodded into moving, he will raise up one that will. God is still in the moving business. God's movement rarely involves waiting, staying, and sitting. Jesus told his first disciples, follow me. Those are motion words. The meaning was clear. Jesus was on the move, and those who wanted to be with him would become followers. They had no choice in that regard because that's what followers do. They follow. For them, it was either move with Jesus Or stay where they were. And Jesus warned, if anyone would come after me, which by the way is another picture language of motion, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their crosses daily, an act of motion, and follow me. More motion. Churches would do well to let go of this seemingly ubiquitous thinking that if we build it, they will come. We would do well to take on the strategic mindset that church buildings are better utilized as forward command centers from which operations are planned into hostile territory. Church buildings should be the hub from which ministries branch out. They should be the base of operations from which Christians strategize, gather, and go. Church buildings should be the rallying point where God's people come together to be re-equipped, revitalized, reinforced, and repurposed. Again, Jesus directed his followers to be his disciples here, there, over there, and way over there. And in a remarkable coincidence, our church just so happens to be located right in the middle of a here and a there, and an over there, and a way over there. We do a pretty decent job doing the way over there. We send people out. We have our mission trips. We have our mission efforts. There's always seem to be something going on. Our big thing going on right now is Operation Christmas Child. We're gathering gifts and stuff. And that's so kids who maybe never had a Christmas before, way over there, get to experience Christ, maybe for the first time in their lives. Our students are meeting today at 4 o'clock. By the way, that's an open invitation for all of y'all to join us in this as we walk over to the Dollar Tree because they can't drive and, and get a bunch of stuff, bring it back, pack it up, put it in there. That is a part of our reaching the way over there, folks. We do a pretty good job of sending our money and supplies to the here's around us and the there's around us and even the over there's around us. But I... I think we could do a better job at just doing the here part. We could do a better job of putting boots on the ground and putting our faces in front of other faces right here in our here. We got some plans, things that we're working on. Uh, Janet and I, we talk all the time about, you know, how we're... We want to take our student ministries, our kids' ministries, and our student ministries out there because that's where they are. Harder and harder it is to get people just to come here, which I'm not sure that was God's intention to begin with. It's out there. And that's what we're trying to do is build up student ministries that will be out there. But to make this mission work, it can't be just us. Much is going to be asked. Many of you, you're tired. Many of you are retired. But we need to ask you to step up one more time. Maybe one more time than you wanted to. Maybe one more time than you thought you would be able to. 
I remember old war movie. I, I can't remember what it was. I thought it was no time for sergeants. I, it still might be. Uh, where a group of soldiers were lined up in a formation. And one of the officers or sergeants, you know, they stepped forward. They're looking for a volunteer for some kind of dangerous assignment. And as soon as that officer turned away, all those people that were in formation, they all took a step backwards except for one guy. And when that officer turned back around, well, there's this volunteer standing right there in front, unsuspecting that he just became the volunteer for whatever this mission was. See, we have a huge need for volunteers who all step forward together, who move together. I read earlier from Romans 10, uh, 14 and 15. By the way, I don't like just coming up here and saying, all right, this is the scripture reference. I like to give the background behind it because it gives it meaning. And in this case, Paul is trying to introduce himself to a church that's in Rome that he so desperately wants to go visit, but he can't. So he's writing this letter, and it deals with all these things about God and what it means to be a Christian and how you practically live your life according to those standards. And one of the things that he says in this passage or this letter to them, he says, how then will they call on him? Talking about the people around in Rome who probably never knew of Jesus. Uh, how then will they call on him who they've not believed? How are they to believe in him who they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? That is motion. That's not someone sitting around saying, Paul writing, hey, you just hang out right where you are. They are going to come to you. They can't wait to hear what you have to say. That's not what this is about at all. No. Uh-oh, lost my slide here. The church is at its strongest when it moves with God. The church is at its weakest when it remains still. A church in motion stays in motion unless a force acts upon it. A church at rest will stay at rest unless a force acts upon it. If you're a note taker... Maybe you want to write this thing down. Maybe jog your memory. Put it on the back of your bulletin. If you're a technical person, I, you know, kids do this now. They'll take their phones out and take a picture of it. That's fine. Do that. Uh, if you're a, an informational hoarder, hey, fine. Come to me. Say, hey, Gary, can I get a copy of that? I've had that happen before. Yeah, I'll get you a copy of that. But if you've taken it to heart and hear where I'm coming from, I'll see you out there where God is moving we might not know what the next great movement of God might be, but we can be confident of this. We know where it's going to be. And it's going to be out there, right where God wants us to be. Let's pray. God, I pray that as you move, God, we are compelled to move with you. God... Maybe not even compelled, God, that we just want to. We want to move with you. We're desperate to go where you're going. God, it is so easy just to, to, to rest. I know I want to. I know the people in this room, you know, it's something that we're all looking forward to. Just rest. So much stuff going on in our lives. Just to think about doing one more thing, it, it's the idea that, you know, I've, I've done my part, and, you know, so many people have. But, God, we know that you haven't stopped, and that you're moving, and that you expect your people to move with you. God, so I pray that you energize us to move forward and to do the work that you have going on. Because, granted, God, you are doing things right here. But we know that you're out working out there and that you expect us to be where you are. Help us in these things. In Christ's name, amen. Maybe you have any questions about, you know, hey, Gary, what are some of the things that you have in mind? What are some of the things that y'all are talking about doing? Uh, I'd love to have that conversation with you because, as I said, we are looking for volunteers uh, in our children's ministries, in our student ministries, all our ministries. If you've got something that you're thinking, hey, I've got an idea that might help us to be able to work and go where God is moving. If you've got an idea, we'd love to hear that too. Because that's the whole reason we're all here to begin with. Because together we can do more than any one of us can do alone. And that's not how God wanted us to work anyway. That's why people who say, you know what, I get my church on the internet. 
It used to be I watch it on, I get my church on TV. Now I, I, I stream Andy Stanley or, you know, Johnny Hunt or somebody, whoever your guy is. Um, I just stream that. Well, God never meant us to get our church on the internet. Matter of fact, the very word church means gathering. Because the expectation is, is we come together and we pull the gifts that God's given us to do something greater than what we could do by ourselves. And the thing is, that work is done out there. This is the preparation place. This is the, the, the hub. We'd love for you to be involved. Maybe you've decided, you know what? I want to get on board. I'd love to be on board with what you guys got going on. I want to become a member of this. We can help you out with that too. If you have any questions, I'll be up here at the front. I'd love to talk to you.